Um, okay, to begin with, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and very good morning. Engineer Datuk Saleh as well as um, uh, TS Ricky Liu Chi Leong, our invited speaker and uh, respected students uh, from aerospace engineering as well as from civil engineering. And I believe there are if there are other students uh, from other discipline, um, I would like to welcome all of you to this particular session, the invited. A session for uh, engineers and society course. So today we are lucky to have our um, returning speaker, right? uh, T.S. Ricky Liu Chi Leong, who is the head of engineering for SR Aviation Cendera Berhad. And uh, for today's session, in, uh, T.S. Ricky will be talking on the topic of engineers as manager, and uh, with a vast. Um, experience um, in the industry. I believe there are more than 30 years um, experience. Um, I believe uh, T.S. Vicky can uh, share the uh, motivation, the tips and the roles of the engineers as manager. So uh, probably Dato uh, Engineer Saleh Jaffa would like to say something before we pass uh, the session to T.S. Vicky. Uh, thank you, Prof. Rahim, uh, and uh, thank you also, Prof. Ricky, for making yourself available. And um, I, I do hope that our students will, uh, you know, pay full attention uh, during your talk. And uh, and we do hope that, uh, you know, uh, the students realize that although you are from, uh, you know, aircraft uh, background, uh, as we mentioned earlier before the session, that uh, students should realize that this is equally applicable. And, uh, and uh, you know, taking note that whatever that you're going to speak uh, from uh, from the industry perspective, it is actually you know it cannot it is not available in the textbook uh, because you know you you find any textbook you wouldn't find you know uh, from the experiences of engineering. So thank you very much, engineering, and uh, look forward to hearing your talk as well. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Saleh. So without further ado, um, I believe it's about time for. Uh, T.S. Ricky to give his talk. So the floor is yours, Ricky. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, Engineer Dr. Rahim. Uh, good morning to Engineer uh, Professor uh, Dato Saleh. Uh, Dr. Rahim, uh, Professor Dr. Rahim, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, it is a privilege to me yeah, to be able to speak uh, in UPM and share the knowledge and experience uh, with the student especially on a very important topic here yeah? this is engineers in society this is a very important topic because all of you all of you will graduate one day and you will go into the malaysian industry engineering industry as part of the important workforce now you are young now you are probably about 20 21 you know you are young now and uh, you as you graduate, as you gather, as you as you gather the uh, the technical knowledge yeah, uh, uh, from the university, uh, you will go into the industry and you will progress. You will progress. So today is a very special uh, uh, occasion to me, uh, especially to share my experience uh, from an engineer to the manager. And I'm speaking actually from the uh, as the head of engineering uh, of uh, SR Aviation. Uh, I'm going to go conduct this session uh, in a form of uh, engagement mode. So in between, uh, if you have any question uh, during my presentation, you can always uh, uh, ask your question, raise your questions, and then I will also, I will try to actually uh, answer uh, on the spot. At the same time, at the same time, I will also ask you some questions so that you can uh, pause and think uh, rather than just listening and, and, and think and consider some of the questions that I have raised, okay, or I'm going to raise. Okay, uh, what I'm going to cover today is that uh, I'm cover a, a little bit of introduction. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, engineering profession and lesson from the past, yeah. Uh, this is very important because as engineers, we are responsible for public safety, yeah. Whether you are civil engineer, whether you are telecommunication engineer, whether you are aerospace or aeronautical engineers, all of us have one ultimate responsibility. That ultimate responsibility is the safety of the public. 
and that is a norm around the world yeah so we want to learn some of the lesson from the past that is something that i'm going to cover then i'm going to move into the required skill as an engineering manager so when you look at the engineering manager you can see wow you know it's nice name you know you are the engineering manager you are the engineering director you are the head of engineering and all those it is very nice uh, uh, to hear that engineers has come up to to the manager level but you must have certain skill this is something that i will going to share with you today and most of us started off as engineers and after that we're going to move to manager and there are some challenges yeah some challenges that you will face that you will encounter and i'm going to share some of it with you so that when you really go <clears throat> into the industry <clears throat> at least you are prepared uh, to to actually uh, prepare yourself uh, as you move on to the career yeah up the career and i'm going to share with you some of the action plan that you can have uh, how to actually develop a successful management career uh, for your future and of course in the end i will give a, a conclusion from some of the very um, uh, famous and uh, successful people their advice to you you know uh, how you're going to move on so generally these are what i'm going to cover in this uh, this session with all of you today okay moving on to the next slide yeah moving on to the next slide um I would like to introduce a little bit of myself because sometimes when I go for a presentation, when I go for talk, people wants to know whether this person has sufficient technical background, whether this person has sufficient any other background to qualify him from the talk. Especially, uh, I believe uh, UPM, eh? uh, I, I find them they are very um, they are very particular about finding the right speakers. To share with the students because they do not want to get any simple person who don't have the background of engineering who doesn't have the the right experience to share with the students and therefore therefore they choose very very uh, thoroughly okay i probably share myself a, a little bit of my background i started off with uh, malaysia airlines back in the 1989 and uh, i joined malaysia airlines as a trainee engineer a uh, trainee artisan yeah trainee artisan from the very very level low level that means you see the when we go into engineering field even though even though you we graduated with engineering degree and all those but a lot of things we have to start to learn from the bottom if you want to be a good engineer you know don't do not actually mind you know don't mind that you are being offered a, a position that is uh, a little bit low to start from the bottom because this bottom work that you're gonna work in the field in the company will become your fundamental knowledge to make you a good engineer so i started off in malaysia airlines as a trainee artisan back in 1989 and subsequently uh, after three years uh, of training i actually got my aircraft engineers license from uk and very fast yeah the Malaysia Airlines very fast. They actually took me back into the system again and to be trained as an aircraft engineer. So I established as a licensed aircraft engineer in the 1993 and actually work uh, uh, on the uh, Boeing 737 production line in the hangar, not in the line. Yeah? So when we work in the hangar, that means uh, you go deep into the systems. We, we have line maintenance and actually and uh, the base hangar maintenance. The base hangar maintenance is the very major operation, especially for uh, HMV, heavy maintenance visit, where you strip the airplane, everything out. And therefore, it becomes a very, very complex job. So I choose to be in the hangar so that I can get involved in all this complexity of the aircraft where you dismantle everything. You paint strip to the bare metal. Everything out is taken out of the airplane until the bare airframe and the wirings. So this is uh, something that uh, I think engineers should start uh, from the very bottom. You know, a lot of the engineers, sometimes after they graduate, they always have the mindset that I want to only sit in the aircon room. You know, I want to work with pen and pencil. Okay, you, you can be like that. But then for a true engineer who knows a very strong knowledge on the field, you actually have to be on the field, at least for a little bit of time 
and get the experience yeah so after 1995 yeah uh, i actually uh, i joined uh, eva airways corporation now eva airways corporation i joined as a station engineer in the subang and also in the klia the thing about evergreen or eva airways is that i have to be rotated back to taipei and my rotation back duty travel back to taipei it is not just two days three days one week it is for months one you know one cycle it is actually two months after two months i will come back i will come back to uh, the line station in the what they call it in the uh, subang and klia and then after that i will go back again for another two months the reason why they do this is because they want me to go go into every department whether it is a training department maintenance control department power plant department you know a uh, uh, training department they want me to go into the department and start picking up all the necessary skills and knowledge so that you can perform as a proper engineer that is what i actually uh, uh, gone through in uh, uh, eva airways until 2002 yeah and then of course uh, subsequently after that in 2002 uh, um, I actually joined uh, LM Royal Dutch Airlines uh, as a station engineer as well. Uh, Roy KM, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, uh, I'm a ground engineer. Uh, I don't do very much of management, but I do a lot of administrative administrative matters, which means that part of the uh, operation, operation, I'm involved with technical publications, I'm in, involved with rostering, you know, all these are being... Uh, done or i have to do it so that uh, i can actually help the manager to actually operate you know or manage the, the station but from the state from the perspective of the engineer so you can see for the last 1989 until 2005 very very uh, I, I actually in an environment which is very um not only require my technical skills but also learn start growing and learn to manage the engineering management so all these are started so when we go out to work in the field especially students when you have graduated yeah please do not be choosy about your work I, I, I'm, I'm saying that if you have let's say you are doing uh, aerospace engineering or you're doing uh, uh, civil engineering when you go to a company in the con in your re relevant field yeah after you have joined in especially when you're fresh graduate you are the model you have you are the model to actually start from the bottom for people who already work for five or eight years uh, you ask them to start from the bottom they start the model you know sometimes they also don't like it you know but if you are a fresh graduate don't mind you know you don't you should not be uh, be very concerned about starting from the bottom because the bottom is where all the necessary basic fundamentals you need to know for example, there are times in my company that they say, uh, my technician or my engineers come and tell me and say that um, we are not able to execute this project because we do not have this. You know, for example, this uh, specialized, very specialized tooling and equipment. But because I was on the floor and I, of course I, I set up the logistics uh, last time, many years ago, I'm able to tell them, no, this equipment is there in this rack and you can go into the system and actually find this item, you know. And many a times, out of the ten times, eight times, you 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 they come back and say, yeah, yeah, it is there. So why? How do I know that? Because I started from the bottom, very very fundamentals. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> we are coming into the section, the section, the section where we are talking about our engineering profession okay engineering profession and the lesson of from the past now i want you all to look at this person especially students from the aerospace uh, uh, engineering uh, look at this person do you recognize this person or not he's an engineer yeah he's an engineer do you all recognize this person any students from the aerospace or probably because this case that happened in 1986, yeah. This case that happened in 1986, 
shows how important our engineer is. How important an engineer, before even you go into management level, your basic skills, your fundamental hard skills and knowledge is so important before you go into management. And this is the person who really know what is he talking about. He knows the technical stuff of the design of the, uh, the this incident. Any anyone can recognize this person? Uh, no, doctor. No, eh? Okay. Now, this is Alan McDonald. Yeah, he is the director of space shuttle rocket booster project in 1986 okay he is the writer he is an aerospace engineer and he was the director of the space shuttle project that designed the design the booster rocket on the space shuttle so he knows he knows this space shuttle booster rocket what is this capability what is this strength what is weakness he knows because he's the engineer and all of us as engineers anything that we design we should know this is the important because it's our core knowledge however in 1986 despite his warning to nasa despite his warning to the nasa technical team that the space shuttle cannot be launched but they decided the management the NASA management and also his higher level boss decided say no, you can, you can actually, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, launch the, the rocket. Mr. Alan McDonald, as a responsible engineer, he said, I am not signing the re release document. So he did not sign because he knows the Robert Booster rocket is going to fail if they're going to launch. Can you imagine one small little seal o-ring on the rubber on the rocket booster he knows because of the temperature at that time when they want to launch the space shuttle the temperature of the launch center has already gone down to minus it was very very cold and thus he knows the seal will not be able to seal the rocket the jet Plus the burn. He, he knows. He, he warned them, don't launch it. This is dangerous. You know, I'm not, and they force him to sign the documents. He said, no, I cannot sign. And what happened? His boss, his boss, which means the higher level, actually signed the document and released, and NASA launched the rocket. And NASA launched the rocket. And because of this, not adhering, not listening to the engineer who designed it seven crew yeah seven crew was died seven crew was killed and out of the seven crew yeah of course all of them are important out of these seven space shuttle crew six of them are all engineers six of the seven crews are all engineers now if you if we look back and trace back our uh, space shuttle, all the space launch in the United States, even the Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong is a mechanical and aerospace engineer. If we look at the space program in the United States, I would say 95% or 98%, they are all engineers who are trained as mission astronaut. They are engineers who are trained as a commander. They are engineers who are trained as a pilot and all those. So from here, you will see why there's a, such a crucial program. Why do they send engineers? Because engineers had the core knowledge that is able to solve minor problems, um, major problems, and even complex problems. So engineers must have this skill, must have this skill. The, the reason why I'm saying this is that please do not think straight that I will straight away when I graduate, you know, now you're studying, right? I will, straight away, I want to be manager, uh, engineering manager. Before you even reach that level, remember your core knowledge, you must grasp it first. And 
And what happened in the space shuttle program? Because the temperature is so low, the seal cannot hold the, the uh, burning inside the booster rocket and it will leak out. Once it leak out, it will actually start to uh, explode and burn the whole boosters. And that is what really happened. Now, if you look at the right hand corner of the picture that I'm sending to you, I'm showing here, this is one of our airplane, yeah, that is actually the seal is leaking. Same principle on the rocket just now. The seal is leaking when this was actually in the uh, in Russia. Yeah, in Russia. It was minus 22 degrees C at that time. And we can see even the aircraft seal that has been parked, prolonged parking, yeah into the uh, prolonged parking at the uh, in the uh, low temperature condition it actually the seal will leak same principle on the on the rocket as well so if you understand the principle of the seal the integrity of the seal yeah, you will know if it's not designed for very very low temperature it will fail as an engineer as an engineer we know that no this rocket cannot be launched because it has actually went beyond the threshold. If you launch, there will be uh, incidents and accidents. And that is exactly what happened on this space shuttle program. So looks, I mean, uh, guys, you all are engineers, be very proud. Yeah, be very proud, especially you're from UPM, uh, UPM engineering graduates. Yeah, you all are known to actually have a very good capability during your time in upm learn as much as possible get as much as possible from all your very good lecturers very capable lecturers yeah now let's look at the uh, uh, the other incident okay just guess what airplane is this can anybody guess what airplane is this Cannot guess. Okay. This is the 737 MAX that actually crashed. Yeah. Crash off of Jakarta. Okay. It crashed off of Jakarta. 189 people killed on 29 October 2018. It's a Boeing 737 MAX. 189 killed. Okay. First incident. Yeah. First incident. Before that, there is already repeated reported defects on the system already. But because there was no proper action, correction, corrective action, the airplane continued to fly and it crashed. Now, on the right hand side, this is actually at Ethiopian 302, flight 302. A few months after the, uh, the uh, Jakarta crash, it is actually in Ethiopia, another 737 MAX crash again 157 killed 157 killed now because of this because of these two crashes the radio the radio program radio station was looking for engineers to discuss about these two incidents but i did not discuss about these two incidents but i discussed about the safety from the engineer's perspective what is the role of the engineer in terms of safety and i agree, i only agreed to went to the uh, uh, online or on air only if they agree that i'm gonna i'm not gonna touch anything about these two crash except to touch about the safety duty and the role of an engineer and eventually they agreed and i was invited to share the discussion about this now I'm not going to go into the technical aspect of the system, the MCAS system, the angle of attack system. All of you have studied about the angle of attack and all those. I'm not going to go into the detail, but I want to show you a shocking truth. Yeah, was found out. Out of 14 board members in Boeing. Now, Boeing is a technical, eh? is a technical organization, which means that it's an engineering based organization. Yeah. So out of the 14 board members, when the incident happened, can you guess how many board members are engineers? You know, Boeing manufactured thousands of planes, right? And thousands of planes are manufactured and safety of the public is at their hands, right? Now, 
sitting at the board to manage the Boeing. Can you guess how many engineers are on the board, sits on the board of Boeing? Anybody can guess? Two, two, two. pretty close, pretty close. Okay, probably I just share. Out of 14 board members, there is only one only. For an engineering company, which is so important, out of the 14 board members to manage the whole Boeing divisions, commercial divisions, yeah, there is only one engineer. The rest are accountants, finance people, or other people who have non-engineering background. So it is very important, you know, especially in an engineering-based organization, the management people, yeah, the management people, you need to have a fair amount of management people coming from the engineering background because our product is engineering products, technological-based products. If you don't have engineers, enough engineers, who is going to challenge your ideas? This is exactly what happened on the Boeing 737 MAX. The system required a redundant backup system. It wasn't there. But how do accountants know? How do financial people know? But if there is another engineer who sits on the board or another couple of engineers who sit on the board, they know very well the rules, the aircraft design FAA rules, part 21 requires a redundancy of the systems. Straight away, the, our engineers will know one. We will know. So it is important, especially on engineering-based company, to have enough managers coming from the engineering background. And that is why I believe Board of Engineers, yeah, even in the ACTA 138, yeah, Registration of Engineers Act, they spell out certain requirements, you know, especially in the consultancy firm, yeah, how many engineers must be there? You must have enough, more than 50% must be, must be from engineer, engineering background for the directors. So that is something very positive and very careful that the Board of Engineers actually form and implement and execute all these requirements. So we are very fortunate, yeah? We are very fortunate. Now, this is the third incident I want to share with you because I understand some of you came from the uh, the uh, civil background and i want to share with you this incident yeah if you look at it you know you can see here that a building has collapsed a construction building this is a 10 floor building that has actually collapsed in singapore in 1986 you see just now 1986 january the space shuttle exploded 1986, three months later, you see, another bu building collapsed. You know, all these are engineering-based, uh, uh, actually uh, engineering-related uh, incidents and accidents. So on 15 March 1986, in Little India, Singapore, a 10-story hotel, a 10-story hotel actually just collapsed just like that. Just collapsed just like that. So people have died, you know, about the... About the I think about 17 or pe 70 people died or, or something like that, you know, but a lot of people have injured, yeah? So, this building has collapsed, has led to an investigation, and the report came out that one of the findings or one of the, uh, the remarks or statement inside the report makes it very clearly here, yeah? They say the skill of managing, managing, the unknown does not merely apply to engineering field, which means that we are talking about the management skill of the, uh, the engineers. You need to have this engineering management skills, okay? Managing the known and managing the unknown. Managers manage. Okay, now, in the report, it also says that the collapse of the Hotel New World was also due to improper maintenance throughout the period, throughout the operation period. So after this, this uh, New World Hotel was built, there was no adherence to proper maintenance program. 
That means kita that means what happened is that they just built and just left it like that. There is no management managers to come in and manage it, make sure there is maintenance, continuous maintenance. There is no. So that also led to the failure. But the, or the one of the most important is that the main cause of this building collapse is because of the engineer's miscalculation during the designing stage, which leads to the collapse of this building. That is why I keep saying that engineers remember your core knowledge your core skills you must have possessed the core technical knowledge first you know how to calculate the load you know how to calculate the stress you know how is the distribution of all the load you know after how many years what is the distribution of the load whether it is subject to the wind and and with the wind and all those with the wind factor and all those is it able to withstand the load all this you must have the knowledge of it so two things here from this incident. Number one, the engineer skill of miscalculation. Number two, management tada. Other management skills. So this is why the topic, the topic today, engineers as managers is so important. You know, please do not think that, oh, I'm just an engineer. I just design and then that's it. You know, it is not a full stop just like that. You must also know how to manage your projects. You must also know how to manage and see the future. What is going to happen after five years or ten years of this design? All this we must know, yeah? So two key points here, managing, uh, management and also engineer's uh, calculation, which means that your core skills. Okay, now, this is the general career path that you all will involve if you... Uh, if you graduated and then you go into engineering companies, yeah? Engineers involved in design. We are involved in a lot of uh, complex uh, complex uh, calculations. Uh, we solve problems, yeah? We solve problems for the people, for the company safely, yeah? We don't simply solve problems. We solve problems based on the understanding of the principle of engineering, science and mathematics one. Yeah, then we implement the projects. We implement the projects. We want to make sure that whatever that we have designed, whatever that we have calculated, we put it, make it into reality by actually making it as a project. For example, the construction project. Yeah, very obvious one. This floor, last week you see there is no nobody is there. You know that the, the, the place is there. The place is just empty plot of land. Two months later, when you pass by the place again, you see it is fence and seal up, you know, and you can see people, construction workers, they are actually implementing the projects already. And then six months later, you can see the base and foundation coming up already. So engineers involved in all these projects of implementing, monitoring, maintenance, supervising, and eventually as you rise up, as you get more and more experience, you gain more knowledge, in the field knowledge, you will, the company will assign you to actually become project managers. These are very common, yeah, very common in the engineering firm. So you have to be ready for it. You have to be prepared with the right mindset for it. So eventually, you manage the projects, and then you deliver, deliver the project according to the specification that we have designed. Yeah, we have designed a. Uh, something it could be a construction building it could be a, a mechanical equipment it could be a test set you know all this we deliver it you know and especially in aircraft you know we have projects airplane comes in fly as a passenger configuration airplane you know the airplane comes in as a configuration of passengers when it comes into our hangar it becomes a project and we con our duty is to convert this passenger airplane into a cargo based airplane and there's so many technical parts are involved your calculation of the stroke the the stress of the airplane the new door how much the load the door is taking you know how much pressurization cycle it can take can the locking mechanism you know hold the the now the cutout the cutout of the uh, fuselage how are we going to compensate back for the strength of the whole airplane all these are technical plus management technical plus management yeah so this is the very gradual path that you will actually go through 
if you choose the uh, the the <clears throat> profession as an engineer. And I hope, yeah, I hope all of you, yeah, when you graduate, you all continue to practice in engineering. Why? Because our nation, yeah, our Malaysian nation, we still need a lot of development, a lot of engineering development that is engineering, a lot of development that is engineering related or technological related. We need the current numbers are very low. We are short of more than 100,000 of engineers in Malaysia. So it is very sad if I see engineers who graduated from the engineering field, but decided to do some other 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 field. Because why? Being trained as an engineer, you have the technical skills that other people cannot get one. Other people don't have one. You can design things to solve problems. You have the you have acquired the skills. So if you if you are going to solve problems, how then how is gonna the country is gonna uh, uh, progress? Yeah. So we are shortage of a lot of engineers. Yeah. Okay. Now, when I come left KLM, I came into this company. This is the company that tested me. That tested me whether Ricky, you have the you have the technical skills, you have the technical knowledge. Can you build up something from zero and then manage it and then get it approved by the aircraft manufacturer and get it approved by the authority? Are you capable of doing that or not? That was my challenge when I was offered uh, this job in uh, back in Subang. I was having a very, very nice and comfortable life with KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. When we travel in KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, we travel, we travel on business class one and all. We don't travel, the engineers don't travel in economy class one. It is our right, you know, privilege. As an engineer of KLM, we travel business class. So I was having a very, very comfortable life in KLM. But to me, I think as I progress in my career, I know I have to go to the next stage, which is actually about management, which is a management. So in 2006, yeah, in 2006, until currently now, as of today, I am still a head of engineering uh, for a corporate jet MRO. We do aircraft servicing, aircraft maintenance, aircraft repair, and aircraft overhaul in Subang. The challenge is, Ricky, you come in, you build it up, and you set it up, okay? So this is the team that we have in Subang. And at the back there, you can see our hangar. You can see the amount of airplanes that we have. At one time, we have 10 airplanes and not enough hangers, yeah? Our hangers is not even enough to accommodate the planes. We even have to rent another hangar to put our airplanes there. And this is the team, the whole team, about 30, 40 of them, yeah? That you as a manager, you have to interface. You have to interface with the non-engineering top CEO. You have to, you have to manage the, uh, you have to interface with the pilots, you have to interface with the finance. You have to in interface with all the the uh, what they call logistics and all those. And and um, mind you, you you also have to interface with the owners of this of this jet. Can you handle or not, Ricky? That was a question I asked myself. Are you able to handle all this, or not, Ricky? You are only an engineer. So I decided yes, I'm going to handle. I'm going to handle this thing. I'm going to build this. Uh, <clears throat> This, uh, what do you call that? Uh, this company, the engineering company up from zero, from zero. Because why I'm confident? Because I've, or I have started from zero last time, many, many years ago. So I know what is happening on the floor and I also know what is happening at the management level. So I decided I was confident. Huh? So I was confident also because why? If you look at the left diagram here, the, the diagram that I'm showing here, now, if you look at this diagram, let me ask you, when you look at one, two, three, four, five, five airplanes, six airplanes inside here, what comes to your mind? What 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 comes to your mind when you look at the left picture that I'm showing all this airplane here? Anybody can, can guess? What comes to your mind when you look at this? Oh, nice airplane, man. Oh, I wish I have all this airplane. No, 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 no. Engineers think, more than that. What do you think? What comes up on your mind on, when you see so many airplanes 
on the left hand side of the picture. Can anybody guess? Okay. Now, when you look at this left picture, the first thing you should realize is that it is all about engineering and technical knowledge. Of course, the airplanes are beautiful. You know, it's so nice to, to see these business jets and all those. But the first thing an engineer look at it is the technicality of it. Do I have the technical knowledge of these airplanes? Do I have the ability to actually do the task, the technical task, the hard skills? This is the first question you ask first. If you don't, if we don't even have this hard skill with us, you tell me how are you going to manage? Cannot, ma. Sure, cannot, one. Because people will actually take you round and round and round and round. Because why? You do not know your stuff, your technical stuff. So the first thing and the required skill of an engineering manager is that your hard skill must be there. That means that uh, if you come from aerospace, your technical knowledge, aerodynamics, vibration system, thermodynamics, the mathematics, your data interpretation, your electron magnetic field technologies, uh, uh, theories and all those, you should have a strong fundamental knowledge with it. So don't waste our time in UPM. Your, our UPM time is only four years only, and you have so many good lecturers around you. That is the best time if you to for you to delve deep into the system because if you encounter problems that you don't understand, the lecturers are all there. But when you come into the field, where is the lecturer? When you have graduated and you look at this this uh, company, this airplane given to you. There's no lecturers what you are working on your own. People expect you to know what you are doing ready. So therefore I advise all the students, when you are still in your undergrad studies, you have good lecturers around you, make full use of your study, anything that you don't understand, go and seek, you know, discuss among your group members, discuss with your lecturers, because this knowledge, <clears throat> We're going to carry it along to the rest of our life. If you get it, you get it. If you don't get it, you become a, you become a, um, uh, uh, this, uh, an engineer, an incompetent engineers. We don't want that, yeah. And the other thing, the hard skills that we must possess is abilities to, the ability to do the job. For example, you must be able to perform calculations. You must able to draft practical hand skills. You must able to go to the field, collect data. You are not afraid of heat, shine, rain, and all those. You are, you like to hold the tools and equipments. You like to go down and check things on the site. These are the required skills. If an engineer, we have one engineer, yeah? I've encountered one engineer. And there was a, there was a structural issue on one of the airplanes. Now I say, this is this is what my calculation is, my own personal calculation, yeah. But I'm only a certifying engineer. I'm not a design engineer. So of course, the design engineer, you should actually uh, do a calculation. So for you to see the structural integrity, you have to come down to the floor to look at the actual airplane, the the damage. And guess what? <laughs> she refused to come down. <laughs> so she refused to come down. So, so, so to me, as an engineer, that means you are you are reluctant to come down on the floor. So you are lack of the abilities required to do the job properly. So don't be like that. Yeah. Now on the right hand side, yeah, on the right hand side, what is the required the next required skill of the manager? Okay, you look at the right hand side. What do you see on the right hand side? What do you see the most on the right hand side? This uh, picture here. Anybody can guess? Uh, the people and the hanger. Yes. Actually, the most important side on this side here is actually the people skills. So on one side, on the left hand side, you must be good at your technical. The right hand side, you must also be good with the people skills. People call it the soft skills. 
So the soft skills, what it means is actually interpersonal skills. You must have the ability to work with people. If you want to be a manager, if you want to be a manager, you must understand how to work in the team, how to perform good communication. You know, tak ada lah, uh, uh, people hantar email satu hari, dua hari pun tak reply. You know, when people ask and query about certain questions, you don't even answer. And then when you when you give your answer, you cannot give a proper answer because why? I mean, if you don't know, if you do not know your technical knowledge well, you cannot answer properly. You cannot ans convince other people. So all these soft skills, listening skills, attention to detail, critical thinking, conflict resolution, it is required as a manager because you will manage people. You will interface with people. For example, recently we have an airplane and this airplane has some technical issues. For example, the structural issues. Now, these structural issues takes more than six months for the repair. Now, if you are the owner of the airplane, you buy a 20 million, 20 US million jet and your airplane cannot fly for six months or eight months. You better explain, man. You better explain to me why my airplane, 20 million you airplane cannot fly for the next six or eight months. Now, if you don't have a strong technical knowledge, you cannot explain one. You cannot explain because why? You don't know what is happening on the systems, on the structures. And also if you, if and this, these owners, they are not, they are not dumb people, no. Whatever that you have reported to them, they will actually find another person to see, to check whether what you have reported is true or not. So you must have these two skills. Hard skills, soft skills must be good. Now, let me go to the next one. Look at this airplane that is in the hangar. Okay. Now, especially on the HMV, yeah heavy maintenance visit when we strip down the airplane and you are the manager who is managing this project you look at the complexity of this aircraft if you if we don't have do not possess the right engineering technologies the uh, uh, knowledge yeah on this field basically you do not know what is happening on this whole project and when you do not know what is happening on the whole project, that means uh, the safety, the safety of the airplane is in jeopardy now. Remember, engineers and safety, engineers and safety work hand in hand one now. It's just like a coin. You know, one side of the coin is engineering, the other side of the coin is actually safety. It's one coin with two sides, engineering and safety together one. So if we look at the complexity of the airplane and we do not know the systems what is happening on the airplane then the safety of the airplane will be compromised so very important it is just like a coin again yeah manager yeah an engineering manager we have two sides one is the hard skills on one side of the coin which is the core knowledge that you have possessed and then the other side of the coin is that the soft skills one coin with two sides, okay? So if you, you see last time when we had this, uh, this uh, what they call it, this uh, heavy maintenance visit, and actually this is a 747, we actually removed the whole airplane completely down. Sometimes when I walk to the airplane, yeah, when I walk to the airplane, I also don't sometimes, you know, I don't believe, wow, you know, it makes me think, can you see the magnificence of the Malaysian MRO skills that we are able to strip the airplane completely down and then rebuild the airplane back, continue to fly another 15, 20 years safely. This is the skills that we have, okay? If you happen to walk around the plane as a manager, yeah, if you happen to walk around the aircraft, the hangar, and you look at your airplane and you have this, these are so many pins pin up to your skin, for other people, they will not know what is this. But for we, as an engineer, we know this is actually a skin change. All these pins there that is 
that is actually on the on the skin now it is compulsory because you have to align the skin exactly to the hole yeah the hole of the on, on the uh, structures and also you can see at the bottom here if you can see hey why is it why is it sitting on the wood you know why is it sitting on the wood you will understand if you have come because we are de-stressing the lower portion de-stressing the lower portion of the aircraft structure so that your skin can fit in nicely without any stress so these are the technical knowledge that we we we, uh, we have we possess as a manager when we walk around the hangar when look at the aircraft projects we know exactly what is happening on the plane even though there are other technicians or other engineers who are, who are who are on the job and you know one thing about human characters human characters when the boss or when the manager doesn't know the stuff doesn't know his stuff you realize that sometimes people make inappropriate or incorrect judgment which which could endanger the airplane operations they wouldn't know they wouldn't know because they don't have the core uh, knowledge but if you are well trained engineers who have the no strong knowledge you will immediately stop them and say no you cannot do this you have to do this this option too which is actually the safer way and many a times many a times yeah in my course of career yeah as the head of engineering for the last 15 or 15 years i have encountered this many many times especially the junior engineers who are still fresh uh, not so much of experience you really need to uh, supervise them and monitor this this uh, this engineers yeah and you uh, one day you are a junior engineer always yeah oh be open mind doesn't mean that you have graduated four years of studies you have the super capabilities you still need a lot of experience so listen to your superiors and managers that is one character that we need to have yeah okay now any questions so far any questions No? no questions. Okay. Okay. In the past, the past few slides have kept on emphasizing the number one of an engineer is that you must have the technical knowledge. Yeah. You must have the touch skill. You must have the technical ability. You must have the um uh the the, the soft skills uh, after that. Okay, now. I want to share with you this incident yeah <clears throat> that happened uh, this year in april in my company yeah now if you look at the center picture here you look at it is you for you for outside people especially people who come from the uh, non-engineering non-aircraft engineering they look at this picture they cannot understand and they cannot they cannot figure out one even even from my from my uh, superior my general manager when i show her this this picture she cannot understand she cannot understand you see i'm confused can you explain to me okay now this is the structure the the belly structure of our aircraft and this structure here that you can see all the frame and the stringers and all those these are the primary structure of the airplane if we have any corrosion on this air these structures here it become very crucial because why primary structures carries the load of the wing yeah the load of the wing to the main structure you know especially especially when you have a wing with the front spine and rear spars the supporting principal structure is actually the stringers so if you have a corrosion on these stringers that means the structural strength of your wing is being compromised whether it can take any strong future load we are not sure so we have to be able to explain in a very very simple term yeah to uh, the non-engineers people non-engineering people so my question back to you my question back to you now can the 13 members of the board of directors of boeing that we saw the two crashes just now can they understand what is the compromise if we have a single system what is the compromise when we have an mcas system that is you know there's so many there's so many reports but no action done so it's very important for an engineer to actually <clears throat> have
have your all your knowledge and the management needs to have a certain amount of engineering people okay now if you have the engineers basically um, especially competent engineers they are the one who actually take care of the safety of the airplanes or any construction or any design that is actually being designed by a company so if you have good competent engineers experienced engineers that your product is more likely than safe than others unless you want to keep cutting costs you don't want experienced engineers you want the, the, the inexperienced engineers then you become a risk you are putting a risk in your product design now this is an email i'm not trying to brag about myself yeah i'm trying to show you and tell you this is a real incident a real case that happened back in the 2009 i was actually called up by the boss yeah boss means a top level boss uh, all those dato dato and the tansri tansri and all those i was called up and said ricky um <clears throat> you go to us and then check out this plane for me so actually it is a gulfstream g280 gulfstream g280 now this G280 is cost about 20 over US million. Okay. Uh, the, the, the original cost of this is about 20 over million. But this airplane has been flying for the last five years. That means it is not a brand new. Brand new airplane, more, more than it is easy because why it is brand new. It's not subject to any operational stress. So it's easy. But this one, it is a five years old airplane that has been flying for more than 1,500 hours. And it's been based in US. Ricky, you go and check and see if it's recommend to me whether it is feasible to bring big, bring back this airplane or not. Of course, as a manager, as a manager, I say, okay, I as a manager, of course, I know my stuff, but I also want to train another junior engineer to actually get exposed to all this stuff. So what happened? I responded that yes, uh, Dato, I will I will go. Uh, but I will bring another junior engineer with me. The reason is because we need to make sure that the knowledge, the experience is passed on. So two of us went to US and actually we did a very thorough inspection. But do you understand, do you see the point here? Why didn't the boss ask the pilot to go first and check? Why? Why didn't the, pi the boss call up the chief pilot very very experienced pilot and say captain so and so you go and check this airplane why he didn't call the chief pilot any 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 one of you can guess pilot has been flying airplane thousands and thousands of hours now they are very experienced why not just send the pilots why why was the pilot not sent uh, because their experience is on driving the plane not actually on the equipment and the performance of the plane okay excellent you are absolutely right pilots are basically drivers and operators of the plane but the technical content uh, the technical details of the airplane has to come from my engineers and of course they, he won't send simply send engineers he want to send managers he want to send managers because managers have uh, overall technical knowledge he has the soft skill who know how to communicate with the people there he has all the all the necessary abilities to know where to look for what are the areas when you look at the structure you know this structure how roughly how many years old can you believe it when i went to airplane i, I went to us i went and checked a few airplanes some of the airplanes reported flying hours is so low but when i look at the airplane this is already a they have reported wrongly or incorrectly. This airplane at least, at least has flown at least 2000 hours. You know, that is that is something that the engineers can through his experience accumulate. The managers know, they are competent engineering manager knows, but the pilot wouldn't know. So that is why when we went to the airplane, we did a thorough check, very one week check and then Basically, the manager has to make a decision and concluded that, okay, uh, Dato, this is the airplane that you can buy. We went to see two or three airplanes. And remember, the boss will take the engineer's word. Okay, 
20 million I'm taking out to actually buy this airplane. You see, the engineer's decision, the manager's decision, it is so very, very impactful one and all. It is safe, that thought this airplane is safe, no corrosion, no structural, no major structural damage. You know, all things are in order. 20 US million just come to US two days later. And then he instructed, pilot, now you go. Now you go. So in the during the whole work, yeah, with during the whole work, the whole project in the US, we talk about the technical of the airplane, we look in the documentations. We communicate with a lot of the engineers uh, uh, and also the managers in US. Eventually, the sale was success, and you can see from this from this email from the senior manager from Gulfstream. Yeah, he said it was a pleasure with you and Lim, my my junior engineer is Lim, uh, on uh, on uh, the G280 Gulfstream 280. He said you are both true professionals, know what you are doing, and are very good at it. This is what we require as a manager and an engineer. We need this kind of skills. We need this kind of capability. Okay. And, and guess what? Guess what? Airplane came back and then uh, it is flying until now. And there is no uh, issue, yeah? Uh, no uh, major issue with the airplane and uh, safe. And the boss is flying, flying everywhere with it. Yeah. So becoming a manager, I'm an engineer, it is a lot of to learn, yeah? a lot to learn. Okay, now manager, the rise of an engineer, yeah? I will always say that uh, manager is the rise of an engineer, yeah? Uh, and especially engineering manager, you have, uh, you have a very, very uh, strong uh, technical knowledge with you. And this is the mission that I was asked to do, yeah? To set up the aircraft MRO and manage it. This was the mission. So you can see the hangar here, you can see on the date here, it is actually in the year 2005. Yes, 2005, the, this hangar was built up, but you see in 2005, uh, in August until December, for four months, for four months, there was nobody technical people coming in to manage this uh, engineering operation, aircraft engineering operation. So the boss, the boss was actually looking high and low and I actually applied to be an engineering manager for Bajaya Air. Some of you might know Bajaya Air. I actually uh, applied to be uh, uh, to be engineering manager in uh, Bajaya Air. But the Bajaya Air general manager took my application, took my application and went to see this boss, the owner of this boss, the, the current hanger that you see. And he looked at my profile and he said, uh, Ricky, your profile is very interesting. Uh, instead of uh, offering you a job in the Bajaya Air, I would like to offer you the, the engineering manager's job to in uh, in this hangar here. The thing is, the thing is, I have all the complete infrastructure, he said. I have complete infrastructure. I have the airplane, but I don't have the right people. Now, he used the word right people. Who is the right people? Again, it's the engineer, no? Again, it's an engineer. So I, I was very scared. Remember, I say I was very comfortable with, with uh, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines uh, as a station engineer. I was very comfortable. But then it is a risk that I'm taking in uh, because there is a complete empty hangar and my duty is to set up from zero and then manage it. So I always like to say myself, at that time, I was the age of uh, uh, 30, 35, 36. At that time, I was at the age of 36. You see, by the time you reach about 36, very likely you'll be at the manager, you are qualified for the managerial position. So I decided that I want to be a man, you know. We always like to say, be a man, take up your responsibility for your actions, you know. So it was then that I decided, they say, okay, uh, even though I took I took a pay cut, yeah, I took a pay cut and then I came in and actually uh, agreed to actually support the boss to actually, um, um, to develop and build up the, the MRO, which is very successful. Lah. So um, we actually became uh, the first Cessna authorized uh, service center, authorized MRO uh, from Cessna for Citation Jet in uh, in this region uh, that we got it in 2008. Uh, we also got uh, our CM approval uh, back in the year of 2000, uh, <clears throat> 2016. Uh, we got it 
and uh, we were actually handling the Berjaya aircraft. Yeah, we were also handling the Berjaya aircraft. So I want to share with you, yeah, the differences and the challenges. Yeah, when I move from engineers to become a manager, yeah, I I like to share this with you so that you have an idea what you have to prepare yourself. At least, yeah, at at least mentally, mentally you should be able to think that okay. This is the environment. This is the thing that I do, and this is the future thing I need to do as a manager. Okay, the first one, yeah. We as engineers, yeah, we are very, very uh, focused, yeah. In terms of focus, yeah, we are very focused as an engineer on our technical and scientific tasks. We are very good in design. We are very good in actually drawing. We are very good in doing calculation. We are able to actually lay out the whole schematics of what's going to happen you know i always feel that engineers yeah engineers engineers always have a pencil or a pen and a paper one anything that they want to design right it always start off with a sketch one it always start off with a scratch let's say for example if i want to design a a, 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 a ground equipment let's say a, a, a water cup if I want to design a water cut to use to service the airplane, I actually always have a paper and pen to draw. So we are very technical and specific. We can draw roughly, this is the dimension, uh, this is the weight, this is the capacity, and this is the load, you know, this is how we're gonna move it, and this is what the supporting uh, human need to have, how much uh, pressure that is supposed to have. So we are very technical, but that is our focus as engineers. As a manager, where is our focus? Some of you have mentioned it just now. Your focus is on people. People. So talent recruitment. Yeah, we do talent recruitment. All the staff, engineering staff that I have in my company now, it is all recruited by me. That means I must know how to identify the talents. Usually, how do I identify the talent? Whenever fresh graduate come into my company, I give them an aptitude test. I give them a, a written test about the subject that they have studied during the undergrad. So if the students didn't study enough, he will fail the paper. So when he failed the paper, the recruitment paper, that means he cannot go to the next stage. That is why I keep emphasizing your technical core skills is very important because that is what we're going to use to cari makan. That is what we're going to use to be on the floor. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies, yeah, they actually use this entry examination to test your basic knowledge because basic technical knowledge, I don't have to interview you, but I see how you write the answer, how you answer the paper. I know already your technical knowledge is up to which level, your hard skills is up to which level. Yeah, so I do recruitment. Yeah, your focus is on the paper. We talk about relationship. We talk about resources. Do I have enough money so that I can actually operate uh, how much budget I need, you know, what are the projects that my people actually get to need to be involved. So it is very focused. That is the first thing. Engineer focus on technical tasks, scientific tasks. Managers focus on people, focus on people. Very important, yeah? Tune your mindset, yeah? If you move to the manager level, because the first thing is people. Now, decision making basis as an engineer what do you do engineer we always do calculation ma yeah we always we always use the data that we collected ma and then we can actually interpret the data and can make a decision ma correct ma? so our decision making is adequate based on adequate technical information with great certain certainty so when for example yeah uh, we receive the engine health monitoring report that means the engine performance data are sent to us. Yeah, the graphic similar to the graphic here was sent to us from, from Canada uh, every month. And usually I will take it up and then I'll read and interpret. So when I interpret the data, I will say, okay, this engine uh, is still very healthy. It's still very healthy. But if I pass this to another non-engineer, he can see the graph and all those, but he cannot interpret. So our decision making is based on the technical information with great certainty. However, as a manager, our decision is decision 
making basis is actually sometimes it's quite fuzzy. Quite fuzzy because why? Because there is some uncertainty element. We, have, we are talking about market forecast. We are talking about people's behavior. We are talking about customer needs that sometimes is very hard to quantify. So you can only have some estimation and make the best choice or best decision. Okay, people's behavior now are towards, you know, everybody is scared of COVID-19. You know, let's make a decision and, and, and uh, uh, make a ventilator, you know, design a ventilator, a very cheap ventilator so that the people can actually uh, help the people. So, but you say people are scared of COVID-19, right? But you can still see a lot of people walking on the street without wearing any mask. So it is a very fuzzy kind of information when you have a, a managers, but you have to make the best decision based on your understanding and discussion with your fellow colleagues. And this is very important, yeah? This is very important. Now, involvement, yeah? Okay, what engineers are involved, yeah? Engineers basically are focused on their individual tasks. You can see from here, yeah? And, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, you will be very specific in a system, electrical system, or in your building system, building automation system, or even on the aircraft uh, checks, specific checks. Your involvement is very individual. It is you and the task, you and the task, you and the task, you and the job. Okay. But managers, your involvement, yeah, you have direct work with others, one and all. As a manager, we sit there. Okay, planning department, what is your plan? Okay, you lead them. Okay, no, I don't think this is, uh, I don't think that this is feasible. Let's organize this and readjust the schedule, you know. So you are actually direct, you direct work of others, you direct them, you lead them, you control them, you manage them. People, people, no more techni individual technical tasks. You are actually involving in the whole operations, yeah. So I just show you this example here, okay? And this is an incident that, uh, not incident, this is our project back in 2000, 2016, yeah? This aircraft was actually from Philippines, yeah? You will see the airplane here, from Philippines. It was in 2016, and I received a call from one of the PA, the personal assistant of this jet owner from Philippines. So he called me, he said, Ricky, I, uh, uh, I have an airplane that would like to perform these checks. So I, I said, yeah, uh, we can we can perform this, uh, this text. This will be our next project. He said, but Ricky, you have to be very careful because why? These airplanes must meet the schedule. You cannot delay the airplane because Mr. Rodrigo Duterte, Duterte yeah? at that time he was, he was only a mayor. Yeah? Mr. Duterte, we're going to use this airplane for his Philippine 2016 Philippine presidential election. Can you take it or not? Can you take up this project or not? Make sure there's no delay. So of course, uh, at that time I agreed. Yes, we will take up the we will take up this project, but I will need full support from your side, which means the communication. Anything, anytime I need communication, I need answers. Anytime I need to have uh, your accounts and all those, your your technical accounts and all those, you must be able to give me fast. You don't delay me. Then I will actually make a decision and say. Yes, we can do it. And guess what? You all should know, Mr. DTT used his airplane, flew around Philippines, and he won his election. Yeah. So when you, when you are involved in the as a manager, you realize the impact that you have by redoing a good project and handling managing a good project. This airplane went went back, flew on time, and actually won the election. And people of Philippines now is under the president of Mr. Rodrigo Duterte. Can you see the impact the decision of engineering managers can do to people? Huge impact, yeah? So be proud, be proud of our job. Okay, work, work output. In terms of work output, yeah, we are actually, remember I said, we do calculation. We are very, we measure our output one you know. We look at quantitative one. We look at the quantity. We look at the results that can calculate one. That is engineers. For example, we I want to know the structural strength of this. How many cycles of this landing gear struck can actually take? We can 20,000 cycles. Each cycle, this is the load. Maximum ranges from here to here. 
So therefore, at least 20,000 cycles, not no, no issue. Quantitative, this is our work output. But as a manager, we are more on qualitative one. No? Huh? So instead of quantifying, so you are actually doing qualitative measures. For example, what is the, what is the, what do you call it? Um, what is the efficiency level of our production? What is the uh, innovation level? You know, except financial results that can be quantified, the rest are actually more or less is actually more on qualitative. You can actually majority, okay, or the graph move towards this side, you know, majority side. So that you use that and basis and make your decision. So managers work output is based on qualitative, less measurable, you know, relationship. How are you going to measure relationship? Cannot what? You know, strong, uh, what is a strong relationship? How to measure? Cannot measure. Yeah. Now, the next one, the features is effectiveness. How effective in terms of engineers? How effective? Engineer relies on your technical expertise and personal dedication. No? If your technical knowledge is strong, you understand the system completely. You understand the design completely. And you're very focused on it. You are dedicated on it then your efficiency, your effectiveness will be very good on, in terms of the work output, very effective. Oh, okay, I want to design an airplane that has have this maximum speed and at this altitude, yeah? So I have good technical knowledge, then you, have, you become a very effective. However, as a manager, yeah, as a manager, you rely on interpersonal skills to get work done. For example, we need to motivate people we need to motivate the team. We need to delegate the team. And also, you also need to trust your team. Managers need to trust your team. If you don't trust manager, don't trust the team. You end up doing all the job yourself. Yeah. So rely on interpersonal skills to actually get work done. If you are good at it, you will become a successful engineer and also a successful manager. Some engineers are not successful as manager because their interpersonal skills are, the soft skills are very weak, yeah? Now, as an engineer, yeah, you tend to be very independent, autonomous, yeah? I give you one particular small uh, uh, area and then you actually um, uh, work on it, yeah? You work on it and then focus on it. Okay, and then you complete the project and then you deliver the, the project to the manager. Okay, you are very autonomous in your own area because remember, manager trusts you. Man. Okay, now managers, in terms of dependency, we are highly dependent on others. Okay, you have a big team, logistics, uh, you have uh, logistics, you have a uh, planning, you have a uh, quality assurance, you have safety department, you have operation department, you have flight handling departments. You are actually interdependent on them to look at the, to ensure the overall, overall operations meets the target. So you depend on a lot of people. Yeah. So that is why I showed the slide just now. We need to have managed people. Respond, in terms of responsibility of an engineer, we usually pursue one task at a time. We usually pursue one task at a time. And in terms of uh, managers, we pursue multiple objectives concurrently. Yeah, like I mentioned just now, you have planning department under you, you have a, a QA department under you, you have safety department, you have operation department. All these are under you. And you as a manager sits out there, you manage all these concurrently make sure it delivers the target yeah it is very interesting it is also very challenging yeah sometimes you get one department going but the other department do not want to cooperate and if the two department don't want to cooperate what are you going to do you as a manager you will go down and solve this relationship problem we, we very often as manager we do this yeah okay in terms of creativity, our engineers' creativity are actually technology-centered. Yeah, we are very focused on the tools, yeah, the instruments, 
Yeah, we are very instrument of program, programming and all those. We are very technology centered in terms of creativity. However, as the managers, again, uh, people centered conflict resolution. Yeah, if you have a conflict between two departments or several people and your staff, how are you going to resolve this conflict? This is your skills. Problem solving, how are you going to solve the problems? The logistic department say they cannot move forward because why? The vendor are not supplying. So how are you going to solve this problem? We're going to call the vendor and use our relationship with the vendor to actually solve the problem. We have political alliance. Political alliance means other party, other companies that actually uh, uh, strong with us, have very good connection with us to actually get our projects going. And also we have a very strong network. A lot of people, they cannot solve at the mid level or the lower level. The managers are supposed to solve the problem at the uh, uh, managerial level. And very, very common, yeah? Very, very common. For example, um, <clears throat> like the two days ago or yesterday, uh, two days ago, Saturday, yeah. Saturday, we have uh, uh, we, are, we are having a corrosion uh, issue on one of the structures. And I told them that, okay, clean up the structures and then we'll do a measurement. He said, I got no equipment to measure, you know? I said, okay, never mind. You just clean up first. And then two hours later, I told them, I solved the problem and told them, okay, this is where you're going to get your measuring equipment, which is actually was done and this was uh, solved. Okay, features. What is our features as a managers? <clears throat> I mean, as engineers and managers, yeah? Engineers, we are very concerned about how, how is it going to operate? Is it operating or not? Yeah, is it operating or not? Or is it uh, not operating? Is it serviceable? Is it functioning or not? To the specification, that is engineer's focus. However, as managers, not only we want to know about how, but we also want to know what and why. What is happening? What is contributing to this uh, system failure? You know, let's go and analyze, go deep into it. You know, this is how a manager asks, very strategic. You know, why this was not prepared early? What actually went wrong? Yeah. So managers ask about very strategic question to themselves. What, why, and, you know, uh, how to prepare everything in advance. Yeah. So that is uh, managers. Teachers, yeah. Concern. What is the concern of the engineers? Will it work? Like I mentioned just now, will it work? And then for the managers, you say a system that I designed, will I it add value yeah, to the people, to the market, you know, to the financial, to the technology, and to the customer satisfaction? Do I, what I design, you know, or what my project, do I add value? Uh, just like, so for example, just now the airplane from the aircraft from the Philippines, you know, I always ask myself, customer satisfaction, can I achieve to ensure the customer is satisfied? and make sure the election of the Philippines, you know, can go smoothly. This is what my target is. Whereas the engineers on the floor will think about how, what I'm, what I'm going to do, you know, do I actually uh, check the fuel tank first or do I check the engine first, you know? These are very technical, very technical. Yeah, so the difference uh, between the engineers and managers. Okay, those are the, those are the, uh, the uh, features uh, of the difference between the engineers and managers. Any 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 questions so far from the guys? Any questions? Oh, I'm not going too fast, yeah? Okay. Now, this is uh, 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 one slide that is very important for you all to think about and then plan for you, for your own self, yeah? We being as engineers, we are actually, we have a very strategic mind one, you know. That means we see one thing, we want to know what is the uh, uh, result at the back, and we will make ways to actually, make steps to actually achieve the result to the towards the end. Okay, now, in order for you to have a successful management career, yeah, you need to identify your career options. For example, if you are doing a civil engineering or telecommunication computer engineering, or even aerospace engineering, you need to have identify your career options, okay? If I take up aerospace, what are the company's availability in Malaysia? What are the services? If my favorite, if my my favorite uh, 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 job 
is in Malaysia, I will actually move towards it. If I don't have, what is my second priority? So the next thing is that you need to prioritize what you want to be. Options are there, but you need to prioritize. Who's your first option? Okay, first option, I want to work with Rolls Royce. Second options, I want to work with GE in Subang. Third options, I want to work in the CTRM, you know, in Malacca. You know, these are the prioritization you need to make. And then the third one is that you need to make comparisons. Do I want to be a design engineer or do I want to be, a, let's say, a, a, project, a project engineer or do I want to be a program engineer in these companies? You know, so you have to make comparison. Compare with what? Compare with the knowledge and the skill that you have acquired during your what you have studied because we don't want to get trapped by going into a company, employ you, but then you're not good in programming you know, programming solutions, you know, you're not good in programming. So you have to make comparison. I think this is my, my mathematics is strong. And therefore, I would like to actually uh, choose up this programming related uh, uh, function. Yeah. So you have to make comparison of your current jobs, your other jobs compare with what you have. Yeah. And also the other thing you have to consider other factors. So for example, if you are in the uh, in the aerospace companies, yeah, you want to work in aerospace companies. What is the COVID nineteen impact currently to the aero industry? Do I have the opportunity? If I don't have the current opportunity to work in the aerospace industry now, what is the next closest option that I have? And when the aero industry industry opening comes back up, I will have the opportunity to come back in. You actually have to consider all these factors the environment the legal the political you know especially now the COVID 19 impact is so strong all these factors you have to consider yeah and then later you have to make a choice let's say i choose to be in rolls royce yeah in surrender in the surrender plan i choose to be in rolls royce then you have to make create your action plan now inside surrender power uh, engine plant what do they have they have the uh, programming section, they have the welding department, they have actually the fabrication department, they have the design department. So you have to create your career path action plan, which plan that you want, or you want to be in management, uh, 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 production management, then all this you have to create your plan, how you're going to go inside, what is your plan inside, uh, what they call it, inside, uh, 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 Rolls Royce. For example, uh, I, I actually made a mistake. Uh, I would say I uh, make a uh, mistake. If I were in Malaysia Airlines, yeah, after five or eight years in Malay in the production line, I would have actually tried to actually go to other departments, training department, or in the QA department, or planning department. These are the areas that I would want, want to go. And after planning, where do I want to go? All these I have to set as goals. So you have to do the same thing. You have to do the same thing actually in the career, the choice that you have chosen, and then create your career path. Lah. How to create your career path? Write it down. Lah. Yeah, I also did my career path by writing down what I want to do when I was first established as a licensed aircraft engineer in, the, in Malaysia Airlines. That was many, many years ago, and I think I still have that profile that I wrote. Uh, I, I draw uh, last time. So action plan for successful uh, management career. It, you have to lay it down yourself. Okay. Now, before I, this is the last of the, the last few slides. Yeah. I just want to share with you the journey of Sundar Pichai. I think every one of you know uh, Sundar Pichai. Uh, Sundar Pichai is actually an uh, engineering graduate. Yeah. He's now currently the CEO of Google. Yeah. CEO of Google. But if you look at him from the way he, from the time he was born yeah, in 1972, right up to he become the CEO of uh, Google, yeah, you can see the career path that actually he has moved on until he become a CEO. CEO is actually a top level manager. Now you can see he worked after he did his engineering degree, he worked in the material department. Actually, he's, he's a graduate of, of materials uh, engineering, yeah, Magin material engineering technology, if I'm not mistaken. And um, he worked as actually an applied materials department, starting at the very, very uh, uh, low level, and then he continued to work himself 
himself out. Now, because he has very strong technical knowledge, understanding of the material engineering, he is able to articulate and do presentation very well. And that is why he's able to go out. Because the people, things that he can explain, other people cannot explain. Yeah, things that he can explain, other people can explain. And because of that, slowly he moved up the management role. So he joined Google in 2004 as a vice president of product management. And then after that, he actually the uh, appointed of chief of products. And eventually, eventually he's appointed a C CEO of uh, Google. And I've read about a little bit about the background. Why is an Indian nationality, why does an Indian nationality, I would consider foreign, become a CEO in a Google American company? Why is he so successful of that? Why? So based on what I've actually studied behind his background is that he is very, very good and people skill. Mr. Sundar Pichai, it is very, very good in his soft skill. You know, at the Google high level, there is actually very hostile management environment. Hostile means everybody is fighting against, you know, to be the chief, to be the head, you know, to, to you know, to become a, a boss and all those. So it is in a very hostile environment. People are very secretive. They don't want to tell others what are they doing on their hands and all those. But Mr. Sundar Pichai, he's very, very soft-spoken. He is very, very cordial. And he's able to communicate and mix around with the whole group of top-level top level directors. And they actually trusted, because of his good soft skill, they actually trusted Mr. Sundar Pichai. And that is why he became a CEO of Google. So remember, I always mentioned just now, you start off with your technical, be very good at your technical, and then subsequently, you have to be good in your soft skill. Yeah. Now, this is my last slide. Yeah. yeah? This last slide mix basically conclude what I was trying to share with all of you today. You see, technical skills may get you the job. All of us engineer, engin enter engineering because of our technical knowledge. Correct or not? So that is a truth and that is a fact. But soft skills can make you or break you as a manager. So if you want to be a manager, the next thing is that your soft skill must be very, very, very good. Otherwise, you might be you might fail as a manager. You might be a very good engineer, but you cannot be successful as a manager. When you cannot be successful as a manager, the company cannot move forward. Lah. The company cannot generate profit. The company is not effective because the manager is not good. Yeah. So soft skills is very important to your in addition to your technical knowledge. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, <clears throat> for I open up for the questions. But before I open up, yeah, I want to share one parting words. Yeah. Uh, this is my parting words to all of you, especially the students, and also including me. We can be very good in our knowledge. We can be very successful in our manager. We may become a manager in the future. But remember, yeah, we as human beings, yeah, remember our biggest warrior in our life, yeah, is actually our parents, yeah, yeah. In the world, the biggest warrior in our world is actually in the world is actually our parents. Please remember, when you become a successful engineer or a successful manager, never, never forget your parents who have. Uh, work very hard to actually feed us, to grow us, to groom us. Yeah, an engineer or a manager must never forget their parents. Yeah, okay. So I open for uh, questions from the floor if there is any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hand over back to uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Rahim. Thank you so much for your patience and listening. Thank you very much, uh, T.S. Riki, eh, for the inspiring um, talk. And um, I believe some of you have already uh, uh, take note on the uh, features, especially the 10 features that differentiate between an uh, engineer and an engineering manager. So um, I open up uh, for question and answer. Probably there are um, a student would like to ask um, or give opinion. Uh, feel free to, to put it in the chat box or you can highlight it. Um, straight away to T.S. Riki. Uh, 
is it uh, is it yes please go ahead and ask i have a uh, yes so uh, before you say when you went to us they made a false report on the plane okay the uh, the hidden report was found out by us in us hidden i would say hidden i won't say the false report yeah um um there were there are two or three aircraft that we actually visited in us so they are all parked inside one hangar and this is actually in the gulfstream facilities so gulfstream have a department that actually make the uh, airplanes you know airplanes that they want to sell they will actually put it there so they they advertise a few serial number so i pick a few serial number and uh, went and had a look and uh, of course i look at the airplane i walk around the airplane and i look at the the wheel well i look at the landing gear i look at the brakes you know i look at the structures and all those and of course the next thing i would after i look at it i would actually pull out the uh, logbook i say i want to look at this aircraft a logbook so when they show me the logbook then i look at the hours and the cycles yeah hours and the cycles and the cycles were hours were reported was only a few hundred hours a few hundred hours which is not many you know not much you know the the airplanes but the the deterioration the leaking on the systems you know the uh, deterioration of the paint coating and the protective coating it is definitely more than 1000 hours so in that sense i actually concluded that okay this is a false reporting of course i i wouldn't say say it to the to the manufacturer i say hey hey you you all you do you know that this is a false reporting i don't say it lah. but i would take it that my conclusion my conclusion of this airplane inspection is that this airplane is more than 1000 years old and we do not know what how many years old so the deterioration internally of the airplane might be more so therefore we take the airplane off that is one yeah? that is one case yeah? the second case we have was actually a falcon a falcon uh, a falcon business jet in thailand again uh, the engineer must go so again i took my junior engineer and both of us we went to uh, bangkok and uh, we get access to the aircraft and we did an inspection and we did a very very thorough uh, documentation record and Based on the technical record, this airplane was underreported by four years old. And they can, they can dare to do it. Huh? They dare to do it. Huh? Underreporting by four years old. And after that, we look at the modification status and all those. Then we concluded that this airplane, instead of they reporting only six years old, actually it is 10 years old because they underreport four years old. And we justify the reason to the owner, yeah, to the owner by showing to the records and therefore we decided that we are not going to consider this airplane so two cases so only an engineer can is able to do it managers cannot do so these are the two real examples that i've encountered and experienced yeah um ricky um yes while waiting for um the rest to answer uh, ask question maybe i can ask uh, one question um yeah. in in your opinion probably from your experience um how do you manage the expectation from the owner your your bosses as well as the technical uh, um, facts uh, because um, as the example given earlier about the tragedy on the um shuttle or challenger um um case um mm -hmm. how 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 can um the engineer can um 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 approach the situation what need they need to do to do uh, to do um, in order for them uh, to uh, resolve the situation in a good manner thank you very much okay all right <clears throat> um you know the um, the owner <clears throat> the owner are very concerned with safety one so when we approach a certain a technical question being posted by the owner we always approach it from the safety perspective we always approach it from the safety perspective so for example if we report to the owner and say uh let's say that your aircraft has to be grounded because of there's a corrosion you see, when you only mention corrosion, they say corrosion is very common, but we just actually just clean it up, you know, and then I just repaint the area back. 
So that is the common knowledge that they have. So when we tell them that, oh, no, Dato, we have to do more than that, that means that we have to clean the corrosion, measure the dimension, and then we will actually uh, recalculate the strength of the structure. Okay, that's one. Number two, this part of the structure is always subject to the landing load, the flexing load of the wing, the landing load that is transferred from the, uh, what they call it, from the kinetic energy, from the landing impact to the wing structures. So we have to calculate it. If the structure uh, uh, remaining, remaining uh, structure is after we have cleaned up the corrosion is less than what is the required, then the structure will fail the structure will fail after some time. So usually when we approach from the safety aspect, they can actually uh, accept and understand. So the factual th these are the very basic factual things that we have to present to them. But if you, if let's say they insist, no, 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 my house, the car, the car Porsche, the Beamer has corroded for so long, nothing happened also, you know? So you have to, continue to educate them again and explain to them again. Usually they will accept, but if they don't accept and force, you say, no, I want my airplane to fly, then you will be like Alan McDonald and I will behave like Alan McDonald. Uh, Dr. Thank you so much. I, I'm not gonna jeopardize your safety and I cannot deliver unless we do a repair and I I'm not gonna sign off these documents. And I'm very sorry, I cannot deliver this one. I think it's better for me to go. So you have to be ready like that now as an engineer because of our integrity. Because remember, safety and engineering is two, two sides of a coin, no? So I have not gone to that stage, but these are the facts that I actually presented to them. And so far, yeah, so far, all the, 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 the data eventually they accept. The only challenge we face is when the PA send you, can you explain, can you explain to me this, the danger of this, uh, this structure or this uh, damage or this corrosion? That is the time that your technical knowledge, you have to be able to translate these facts, yeah, into a very common knowledge so that the PA read can understand the Dato is not an engineering background, he read, he can understand. And I've done it many, many times, you no? Know? I've done this many, many times writing to Tansri, writing to Dato. And there was one time I was even summoned to go to see Tansri, one of the, the directors, Tansri, and explain to them. And and you go there as a man. You know, you just go, don't go over there as high, takut lah, and not jumpa Tansri, tak de. You, you equip yourself with the technical knowledge, know-how and all those. You go there, stand in front of them. Uh, Tansri, this is what has happened. I'm going to draw it out and I'm going to show to you. I'm going to explain to you. And they accept it. They accept it. So as a manager, be prepared to answer. Yeah, be prepared to answer with your good knowledge and technical know-how. And humbly, yeah, please remember interpersonal skills. You have to be very humble and say, no, I'm the engineer. I make the decision. You, 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 you just take my decision. No, don't, don't do it like that. That is very unprofessional. That is very unprofessional. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope I answer, uh, uh, Dr. Rahim. Uh, engineer always interface with non-engineering people that you have to explain. Uh, actually, a lot of bosses, yeah, they come from the financial background, from business background. They don't understand the technical part. So it is our duty to be able to explain to them. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, T.S. Riki. Uh, probably uh, Prof. Datuk Saleh has any input um, on this topic. Thank you, Engineer Ricky, for a very uh, comprehensive and, uh, you know, uh, and I, I can, you know, I learned a lot from your personal experience uh, dealing, but I can also uh, relate to many of your experience. Uh, uh, if I can, I'm not sure whether I can ask so or I can add on. Uh, please, please. I think uh, it seems like the greatest challenge in, in management is ability to communicate uh, to the people of all kind. You're yeah. communicating with your boss, you're communicating with your colleague, you're communicating with your people who are serving you, you are communicating with even the PA, uh, personal assistant, so that they can understand. And it seems that the ability to communicate um, is uh, you know extremely important and therefore the students 
uh, need to be able to you know um, uh, start you know building up this capacity and i think in today's world um, the capacity to actually communicate uh, you know you know there are we talk about verbal communication, you talk about written communication, you need to write good and precise reports. But at the same time also with the today's uh, cyber world, ability to communicate uh, effectively with a short sentences using, you know, WhatsApp, email, uh, <laughs> it yeah, is, yeah. actually can be very challenging, right? I mean, yes, yes. and I think this is, a, 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 you know, a, 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 probably a new skill set that the students or future manager need to be able to understand uh, and and especially in engineering uh, terms they need to be very precise there's no it's how to deliver it and i think in today's uh, 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 generation as well they don't write uh, they don't read long uh, you know long books long sentences they read short ones you know and i'm not sure what, what, what is your what is your uh, thought on this uh yeah you are you are absolutely uh, right uh, the thought you know anytime we have uh, <clears throat> i've learned from the past incident that anytime there was a miscommunication uh it always led up to a, a kind of a, a disagreement or unhappiness among the fellow colleagues yeah? so there was a several incidents that happened during my course even in this current company and nowadays what i do is that um, the moment i see a, 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 a significant or a, an item that require several parties uh, uh, knowledge or, or know several parties need to know usually what i do is i immediately form a whatsapp group and and this whatsapp group usually i form is among the key people so that when we communicate on that particular problem everybody understand it from the same page and actually this have actually solved a lot of the problems for example i just give you an example one of our aircraft was actually technically grounded in the in a Shenzhen uh, quite a few years ago. And you know, when an aircraft is grounded in Shenzhen, we have actually, it will involve the immigration, it will involve the customs, it will involve the local people who are ground handling there. Uh, we are involvement of the pilots, we are local, our, manage, our local management is also involved. So there is so many parties that is looking at this problem that we need to solve. And as an engineer, what I do is, I quickly form a, 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 this uh, WhatsApp group and I put in all the relevant people inside the group. And everything that I communicate, everybody is know what is happening. And that actually has actually been able to mitigate, mitigate the problem of misunderstanding to the lowest minimum level. And the other thing good about this is that when we miss out something, you know, when we miss out something, the other party who is in the group will actually remind you, hey, hey Ricky, look at the custom clearance document 2312. You know, they will actually remind us, then we look at it, hey, yeah, right? it's the documents under 2312 do not allow us to bring in aircraft uh, parts into the into the, the uh, customs. So all these things with the, with the very good tool of this uh, uh, WhatsApp, with everybody in, then we were able to communicate at one page and mitigate the misunderstanding as much as possible and that has always worked with many many of our subsequent incidents so we are able to handle it uh, quite quite okay i would say thank you thank you i totally agree with you uh, prof uh, Tato. yeah yeah <laughs> thank you okay thank you very much uh, for dr saleh and um, um, i think we are running out of time probably there are a lot of other inputs or questions from uh, the audience, especially the students. Um, if you have um, um, inputs or questions, you may ask respectively through me or to Prof. Dato Saleh and maybe we can uh, try to answer that, uh, the, the question. Or if not, we will try to contact uh, T.S. Vicky to provide his answer. So. With that, um, on behalf of the Faculty of Engineering for both program Aerospace and Civil Engineering, we would like to thank you, uh, T.S. Ricky, for your valuable inputs. And I believe the students, as well as uh, me personally, I, I, I learned a lot from your talk. And we look forward for your uh, future um, uh, series of talk. I think if we count from the beginning of your involvement uh, as an invited speaker, I think it's more than 20 it's <laughs> already eh? <laughs> so, thank you okay thank you. any last uh, remarks from you uh, Ricky 
Okay, uh, I would like to share the advice to students that uh, <clears throat> UPM is a very good university and uh, you have very good lecturers. Uh, I don't have the privilege to study like you all in UPM. I was trained in Malaysian <laughs> Airlines and I would hope that the students will make full use of the facilities and also the lecturers uh, that you have there and then be a successful engineer and then together we support our nation uh, because we are in Malaysia, we are really short of engineers and technical people. Uh, to move the nation to the developed nation. Thank you so much and I wish every one of you all the best. Thank you so much. Alright, thank you very much. Uh, thank you Prof. Dato' Saleh and we will meet again next week for the next lecture. I think it's from uh, Prof. Dato' Saleh himself. Okay, so and uh, stay safe everybody. Thank you and Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.